Our session's topic is gender in conflict situation. And it is my privilege for the session's introduction to invite Ms. Natalie Baker, Deputy Chief of Mission from the U.S. Embassy in Doha. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Moza, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Dean Masri. Thank you, Ambassador Kaminara, and the great organizers for this conference today. I'm honored to be here. As you may have noted in my bio, I've invested most of my career in conflict zones in areas of hardship. Throughout that time, I've had the opportunity to meet strong women around the world who are doing heroic work on behalf of their families and their communities. From waking up before sunrise to stand in queues for bread and assistance packages, to resourcefully finding places of shelter to keep their children safe. In my experience, and from what I've seen, women are the foundation for each of these societies. During times of conflict, I've seen women move forward unflinchingly, finding or forging the tools to survive, and not only for themselves, but for others around them. Women have fostered resilience in their children and communities. Women rise up and push and inspire their communities to carry on the determination to survive, even in places where they, as women, are vulnerable to exploitation and abuse and marginalization. In situations of conflict, women are often the caregivers, the educators, the nurses, and whether formally or informally, the negotiators, the diplomats, the communicators, the networkers, the influencers, the judges, the voices of reason, wisdom, and inspiration. When I was the U.S. Charge d'Affaires for Libya, amidst civil conflict, as rival militia groups were fighting bloody battles for control and authority in their villages, the embassy I was leading worked with the United Nations and our U.S. Agency for International Development and other partner groups to gather about 30 militia leaders for two days of negotiations in a lovely beach town in Tunisia. The only women in the room were expats and foreign diplomats like myself. During the meetings, each militia representative stated his case, made his claim for what he needed to settle scores with their rivals, and the discussions didn't really make much progress. But outside the room, in speaking with them individually, I was fascinated to learn that some of the greatest sources of influence for these hardened men were the women in their lives. I had the opportunity during meals and breaks to talk with them about their families, their mothers, their daughters, their desires to give their families a better future. I spoke with them as the lead diplomat for the United States, but I also spoke with them as a woman because my male counterparts couldn't necessarily ask them as freely about their wives and daughters as I, a woman, could. After those sessions, we met with women stakeholders who were consulted on the way forward. They helped us shape potential compromises and offered unique perspectives on how to pursue peace, justice, and reconciliation. Women helped us shape our strategy for offering assistance to rebuild the economies and improve governance across the country even in the midst of the ongoing conflict. Women made a difference. One of the advantages I have as a senior U.S. official, who is also a woman, is the unique access I have to other women in traditional societies. Most men don't have that. In my work, I make it a point to encourage women to take advantage of every opportunity to influence those around them to take action. Women should have a seat at the table in negotiating the end of conflict and in post-conflict peace-building efforts and reforms, and we should insist on it. And women should have a chance to shape their societies. Post-conflict scenarios offer opportunities to transform a society, its structures, and its governance, to include greater support for women's rights, inclusion, and empowerment. 
UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was raised in a panel earlier today as a foundational resolution on women, peace, and security. It was unanimous, unanimously adopted in 2000, um, and it urged member states to include women in peace building and post-conflict reconstruction efforts. Then in October of 2020, 20 years later, the UN, UN Human Rights Council also recognized, quote, the crucial women, the crucial role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts and in peace building and confidence building, the importance of their full, equal, and meaningful participation and full involvement in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security. As we've seen from recent and ongoing conflicts, women and girls are still suffering disproportionately from the impact of armed conflict. And it's hard to believe that here in 2024, we're still speaking on the importance of empowering women across the globe, whether it's in the United States or Afghanistan or Sudan or elsewhere. But forums like this will continue to advance this purpose. Helping ensure our women and girls have a voice in every society is our collective responsibility. We, as those who are privileged to be able to discuss and develop strategies, have the potential to make a difference and improve the lives of women in conflict zones and areas where women's rights aren't respected. How do we do that? By unifying our voices and minds, working together, bringing together our comparative advantages. We can target problems, identify strategies for addressing them, and gather the resources to take action. The U.S. government supports a number of educational and professional exchange programs that aim to build skills and diverse networks among women and girls. These programs equip women with the tools they need to prepare for leadership positions and to contribute to peace building, good governance, and economic development in their communities and societies. We also have an excellent model of women empowering women, women empowering women in Qatar. Uh, through the Qatar Foundation, Her Highness Sheikha Moza has built a model of excellence in supporting education and training for people in conflict zones and underdeveloped nations around the world. Here at Education City, women and girls from countries that don't offer or may even prohibit education for women and girls have the opportunity to develop themselves and to pursue their potential without obstacles or hindrances. We need to work together to support more programs like this around the world. One of my favorite programs that the Diplomatic Corps here in Qatar runs with Georgetown University here is the Diplomat for a Day program. This program matches women students with ambassadors and deputy ambassadors in the Dip Corps to give the students the experience of being a diplomat for a day. We host it on International Women's Day, and this year the Canadian ambassador helped organize it with Georgetown. During the program, the young women students shadow the ambassadors and diplomats, walking through embassy operations, and they have briefings and discussions with ambassadors and professional diplomats. I first met Moza, our moderator, when she was a diplomat for a day with the U.S. Embassy. Moza impressed us all with her analytical, articulate, and desire for her analytical skills, <laughs> her ability to be articulate in her arguments more than I am right now, um, and her sincere desire to change the world. The Diplomat for a Day program is the type of simple yet immeasurably significant experience that can change the decisions that a young woman makes for her future. Through connections and through dialogues like Hiwarat, we can harness the power of our support to women and girls and to shape a future where we resolve conflict and rebuild societies through diplomacy. A future where women thrive and are fully involved in supporting global peace and security. It's my honor to be a part of this dialogue with you and I look forward to the session to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker, and it's always a pleasure to have inspiring women like you around. Um, to conclude our day with our final panel, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Dr. Safwan Masri, Dean of Georgetown, as moderator. Thank you. 
His Excellency Kozmanko Andri, Ambassador Extra Extraordinary and Clipincheri from Ukraine to Qatar. <laughs> Dr. Sultan Barakat, Professor of Public Policy, founder of the Conflict Resolution Studies Institute, Hamad bin Khalifa University. Ms. Rafaela Idioche, Chargé d'Affaires and at the European Union delegation to Afghanistan. And via Zoom, via Zoom Councillor Neda Tarbush, Permanent Palestinian Mission to the UN, uh, to the UN Mission in Geneva. Thank you, Moza, and uh, thank you, Natalie, for uh, those wonderful insights for providing the context and more broadly for your robust and multifaceted engagement with GUQ over the years. Um, I love the program that we have where we have students, shadow ambassadors. Um, and I made a request a while ago that we should have male students as well, shadow female ambassadors, because the role modeling that women can provide for young men is as important as the modeling that they do for young women. Uh, and I think that a woman's role um, in the workplace and at home as a role model influencing not only what young girls and young women can aspire to become in the future, but also for young men and boys in terms of how they look up to women the way that they look up to elder um, males in their, in their families and in their, in their lives. Uh, so I hope that we can do that. We can start uh, doing it soon. Um, I'm pleased to have uh, the speakers with us, uh, rich, diverse perspectives. Um, really, really happy um, to have you all here. Uh, Nada, Thank you so much for joining us uh, from New York. We would have very much liked to have you here with us, but we appreciate uh, the demands on your time and everything that you are having to deal with. Uh, thank you for all the great work that you do. You really have been a very important and a very compelling voice, uh, particularly over the past few months with what we have been seeing in terms of atrocities committed um, in Gaza and in the West Bank. Um, I think that at this moment in global affairs, uh, with so many devastating conflicts, there's so much that we could do, um, there's so much that we can discuss. There is a looming prospect also for expanded violence and conflict. Uh, so at these moments, it's really important for us to consider the drastically differentiated impact of conflict on men and women. Some of the commonalities, but also some of the um, differences and differentiated impact. It's equally and vitally important to consider the positive impact of women. And Natalie, you've done a great job also um, in you know sort of articulating the various roles uh, that women play, uh, oftentimes uncelebrated, oftentimes uh, behind uh, curtains uh, that are formal, but more often than not informal. Um, so uh, how women play a role in successful and sustainable peace processes, in conflict mitigation resolution, but very importantly in post-conflict recovery and reconstruction efforts and in reducing the risks of a humanitarian crisis. With so many conflicts around the world, uh, there are many places that we can go to, but what we agreed to is that for this panel, we will focus on Afghanistan, Gaza, and Ukraine, uh, especially given the expertise that we have. Um, I do want to, before we um, get started, quote uh, Michelle Bachelet, uh, the former Chilean president and former uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, when she said, women are truly becoming a disruptive force for peace. Women insist on having a seat at the negotiating table. They lead mass action and they pioneer discussions within and across communal divides. So with that as background, uh, to kick things off, I'm going to give each of you um, around five minutes, if we can, 
um, to set the stage for the discussion and to bring in um, your angle, your perspective, given the area of expertise um, that you are representing over here. So I'm going to start with you, Ambassador. Um, Kuzmenko and Rii is extraordinary and plenipotentiary uh, from Ukraine here in the state of Qatar. And um, I'd like to turn it over to you for the next five minutes so that you can help us understand perhaps um, these questions and the, again, differentiated impact on men and women in the context of the um, crisis, um, the horrible crisis in Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, salam alaikum, everybody. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me to such the extremely important discussion uh, and extremely important topic to be covered. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, 10 years Ukraine is in the condition of war and two years plus we are at the condition of the neo-colonial imperialistic full-scale war launched absolutely unprovocably by the Russians against Ukraine. Obviously, this war heavily affected all the social fields of the life in Ukraine, including the role and situation of women. But notwithstanding, I would like to reaffirm you that Ukraine remains absolutely resolute in advancing gender equality and ensuring the active participation of women in all the aspects and fields of the social democratic life of our country, uh, particularly and including the leadership role. Uh, I will start with a uh, few figures. Uh, under the leadership of our president, Mr. Zelensky, and the government, the representation of women, of women in the government increased up to 25%. In the cabinet, we have a quarter of ministers, female. In the parliament, we have 21% of MPs, uh, which is also much higher than the previous uh, figures. Uh, I'm representing diplomacy now. Uh, as far as diplomacy is concerned, <laughs> I will make uh, one historical uh, fact uh, that the first mention about the Ukrainian lady diplomat uh, was uh, in the Byzantine Chronicle of 1955. It was famous Ukrainian Queen Olga who came with as ambassador to Constantinople at that time just to conclude some peace treaties. Unfortunately, later on, the tradition of uh, the participation of ladies in the diplomatic life was lost. And uh, uh, during the medieval time and later on, uh, we, as actually the majority of Europeans and majority in this world, were considered as ladies as the sweet ambush for some diplomacy. You understand what we're talking about. But uh, this tradition was also uh, continued during the Soviet time and uh, in 1991, uh, with the independence of Ukraine, we have drastically changed the role of women. And we have started uh, the real struggle for their equality, not declare it, but ensure it. Uh, I remember I'm uh, 30 years uh, in diplomatic service and uh, during my uh, time of being the uh, junior diplomat, I remember uh, a lot of ladies, but they were mainly technicians or even at less senior positions. But what do we have for a moment? We have 17 ambassadors, female, and uh, 40%, as I told, 40% of the uh, female in the uh, central uh, headquarters of the Ukrainian ministry. And we are striving 
to have this uh, figure up to 50%. Uh, besides, we uh, have introduced in Ukraine one absolutely unique uh, instrument. It was the initiative of the first lady of Ukraine, Ms. Elena Zelenska, to introduce and to create so-called uh, first lady and gentleman working mechanism. We had three summits of first lady and gentlemen, gentlemen for the countries where the ladies are the first one. And this year it will be the uh, fifth. Uh, and uh, this uh, format is a platform for communication, platform for discussion of mainly humanitarian and gender problem, problems, and for a lot of very good things. It works. Uh, just like steps down, we also have uh, the uh, specific responsibilities for the ambassador's wife. Uh, they have their own network, and in each and every uh, embassy, the wife of ambassador, that's my wife, I'm honored to have <laughs> to say that, uh, they are busy with a lot of uh, humanitarian and social issues also here. But uh, while we are uh, pursuing the gender equality, uh, of course, the uh, Ukraine is uh, confronted with the brutal reality of this ongoing war. Mm. It is enough to say that due to the harsh military conditions uh, and uh, just danger for the people, about 8 million of Ukrainians are displaced persons or and refugees. And about 90% of them, 90% I would emphasize, are the women and kids. Uh, but... Eh? One minute, well, a bit. It's most important, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ukrainian uh, women are the proud of our nation, uh, and they are, uh, the resilience of them is commendable. Uh, we have for a moment 62,000 of women in the armed forces. How many? 62,000. Out of how many? Uh, yeah. 4,000, uh, four uh, this is a, yeah. <laughs> 4,000 of uh, them are directly at the front line. And they're not only like traditional, the communication, uh, logistic assistance. We have the commander of the tank, we have uh, the snipers, we have uh, the operators of the anti-tank systems. Uh, unfortunately, another side of this coin, uh, each week we receive uh, a very sad announcement about their death at the front line. Uh, someone's mother, someone's sister, will never come back to the family. But I also would like, it is extremely important to raise one uh, issue within uh, two minutes left. This is the issue of the grave crimes uh, perpetrated by the Russian military at the front in Ukraine, especially at the territories they have uh, temporarily taken from uh, the uh, from Ukraine, actually. Uh, this is, first of all, sexual exploitation of the ladies. And uh, Russia uses the sexual violence as a tactic of war, a weapon and instrument of humiliation and superstition of the Ukrainian people. Uh, the General Prosecutor Office uh, recorded and proved 289 cases of the sexual violence against the uh, Ukrainian ladies, kids uh, at the temporary occupied and then liberated territory. But uh, this figure is inevitably much, much higher since we do not have the information about the territories which are currently uh, and temporarily out of our control. And uh, on September, uh, 2023, the UN Commission on Inquiry for Crimes reported that, uh, reported to the Human Rights Council in Geneva that uh, Russian soldiers in Kherson, just region, 
had raped and sexually assaulted women aged between 19 and 83. In fact, we also registered a case of sexual violation against four years old child. And this is not, let's say, something of criminal satisfaction of their personal needs, brutal personal needs. This is rather the destruction of women. Mm -hmm. This is about the abuse, about trying to destroy them morally and physically. And uh, it is also worth it to mention that uh, these crimes still uh, shrouded by the reluctance of the victims to express their personal, uh, let's say, evidences. Uh, well, uh, for a lot of reasons, they still silent. However, this problem is as a focus of attention of uh, our government. And on March 4 this year, the First Lady of Ukraine in U uh, Olena Zelenska participated in specific international conference on restoring the rights of survivors on conflict-related sexual violence. And this conference was held in Kiev. It was an international conference with the participation of United States, Japan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Luxembourg, Norway, Switzerland, Moldova, Sweden, Finland, a lot of, of, of countries were taking part. And uh, it was decided to launch the program for, uh, let's say, rehabilitation of the victims of this uh, sexual uh, assault. And uh, about 500 cases are already listed and the implementation started. The first and foremost, uh, they will receive certain uh, money just for physical rehabilitation and uh, for uh, some psychological assistance. Yes. And uh, this is something which is important not just only in Ukraine. This is important for all and every women at the area of on conflict. And this practice should be later on introduced for, I think, worldwide, just not to forget about yeah. that case. And we'll come, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's devastating, um, clearly. And We'll come back to this theme yeah. later on, especially when we hear from Nada, uh, hopefully about the targeting of women and children and, and what aims of war that accomplishes for the perpetrator. I mean, it's a very deliberate. It's not just women and children just happen to be around um, when attacks take place. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, I know how painful it is um, to you and uh, to, to, to all of us um, to see what's been happening. Now, Sultan Barakat is a professor at Hamad bin Khalifa University, and he's also the founding director of the Center for Conflict Resolution Studies, um, Jisr. Um, it's sort of separate from Jisr. You combine two different careers. I, I, I did the conflict. You did the conflict resolution the before. Institute. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah, because I know that you're the founding director of Jisr, but it's you're okay. the former founding director. Yeah. Uh, well, you're not former founding. You founded also the Center <laughs> for Conflict Resolution before. Anyway, uh, we're delighted to have you. Sultan, um, you have expertise that span um, a wide region. Um, and I'm always intrigued when I turn on Al Jazeera English, um, more often than not, I find you there commenting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's a lot to comment on, but you have expertise um, on Palestine, uh, you have expertise on Sudan, you have expertise on Afghanistan, on Russia. Uh, I saw you also commenting this past weekend on Iran and on the. Um, uh, but, but so talk to us a little bit. I mean, what we heard from the ambassador. Um, we heard a lot more about sort of the impact on women uh, in aggression, in, in, in war. Um, we heard a little bit about the role of women. Uh, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in my opening remarks this morning, when I said I used the, deliberately the words natural and rights, uh, it's natural because 50% of the world population of the population of any country is women 
right? So it's natural that there should be equal representation of women and men at the table. And it's the right thing that everybody should have equal representation and equal rights. Uh, so I wonder, and you can take us in to any part of the world that you'd like to take us to, to perhaps expand on this and, and talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Five and minutes. let's try to keep it to five minutes as well um, so that we can go around. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start from where you ended because I was actually going to quote you back about it being natural and the right thing to do. And surprise, surprise, in other culture than Western culture as well. And this is really important. What I would like to focus on is why a lot of these gender policies that have been uh, exported from outside into our context have not really picked up as, sh as they should do, and particularly in conflict areas. And one of the first barriers is that a lot of it is exported to us detached from context. And often you feel as if people who have come up with those new values have just discovered that we also happen to have women. And they forget in the Muslim world that 1400 years ago, the Quran was the first book to actually address men and women. Unlike the previous holy books that talk to man only, the Quran specifically distinguished between men and women and addressed them. And it created a lot of ground that now in the, uh, we, were, were, we heard earlier in Holland, the right for ownership in the 1950s or uh, for political participation or the right to ownership in the 17th century and so on. Right for ownership was given 400, 1400 years ago. Inheritance, etc. etc. The trick is that it has come with a social code. So it regulated the relationship according to sexes between men and women. And those who believe accept it and follow it. Those who do not believe, including the liberals amongst us, would like to change that so that we have a universal value that, that applies to all. And of course, in a world that we live in, and we heard earlier about uh, artificial intelligence and communication and so on, we cannot resist. I mean, we are living in one world, and ideally, we should have shared values on a number of issues. The problem then is that when we give the, uh, uh, the policy on gender, in particular in conflict areas, we conflate, conflate the issue with a, a, a set of values, including democracy, including uh, certain uh, sexual liberty. So, so there are a lot of, the package is so complicated and we want them to take it all or nothing. And then we face resistance, and often because of lack of communication, which I think a point that was made in the first panel about the importance of dialogue, and thank you for the series that you launched in Doha, which I think changed the face of how we talk to each other across universities. Uh, we, we, uh, we end up confronting each other rather than talking through the differences and trying to understand where the other is coming from. And uh, I've spent many, many years working on Afghanistan. I was first in Afghanistan in 1993, I think. So I saw the pre-Taliban, then I lived through the Taliban and the post-Taliban. And I saw the days when the United States imposed a number, a quota on the parliamentarian women and so on, and the achievements that did at the time. But none of it was sustainable. And the reason why it wasn't sustainable, it went against the grain of the culture and the society without taking them on board, without really having that intellectual dialogue at a deep end with the women on the other side. I was intrigued earlier, the president of Lithuania, when she needed to get away from the media attention and the, you know, the man, she said, the man coming, trying to take a photo of her legs and so on, she moderated her dress. That's exactly what Islam asks of women, is to actually moderate your dress, then your space in public sphere is greater. Your ability to move around, maneuver, is greater. And I come from a family, I have formidable four sisters. They frighten me to death, I mean, on a daily basis. But it, it doesn't stop them that being female, operating in, in very, very strong male-dominated uh, area. The challenge then we face is that you give all these values together, 
but they're often given by the liberal side of Western governments, with all due respect. But when it comes to conflict, the ultimate des decision is made by the um, hawks, if you like, or, or um, maybe, if I put them better term, the more realist, if you like, um, in policy making. And this is what happened with the withdrawal of Afghanis from Afghanistan and leaving the issue behind. This is what's happening today in Gaza. We heard earlier about a feminist foreign policy. What does a feminist foreign policy mean to Gaza? You have more than 50% of those killed women and children. Does your foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy take the side of these women and say from day one, killing women is inappropriate? Or does it wait for your realists, for the hawks, to decide when it's time to bring women and talk about them only in the context of their humanitarian needs and the need for sanitary kits and all that stuff that goes on. And I think that's an important question that governments in the West must really uh, address to be uh, on the same uh, level of the discussion with the East. And I, I'm not here, I mean, I'm not standing for anyone, but I just try to project to you the um, uh, resistance that we get when we talk about these issues in those uh, uh, contexts. The other issue which is really difficult is they are often seen as form of intervention. And again, the former president of Lithuania said, she put her hand up and said, in Lithuania, we do not intervene. We support, but we're not going to go into other countries to say, this is how you should treat your women, or this is how issue, things should be done. Uh, it is very much seen as a form of uh, intervention. And again, it is not consistent. I mean, they start with certain aspects, but it, it, you find a lot of gaps here and there that makes it difficult to, to justify. And internally, often the agenda is picked up by women who do not really represent the majority voice. And uh, they will be maybe uh, educated in the West, uh, uh, have had a certain uh, set of life, etc. Uh, and uh, they suffer from the same lack of communication with the rest of men and women in that society, which makes it uh, equally difficult to, to uh, distribute those uh, ideas. Uh, finally, I think I'll, and I'll stop here. When we face all these difficulties, what do, what do we do? We settle for tokenism. Tokenism in mediation talks, tokenism in intervention, uh, number of women who are coming to the talks. Uh, let's make sure that there are six years, five years, three years. But you know 100% that none of them is going to have any impact. And we still insist on bringing them to the table because they are women. And we suddenly forget all the wisdom we heard this morning about personalities matter, skills matter, who they are matter. It's not just about whether they're men or women. We have to look deep. When it comes to our context, coming from the outside, it gets reduced to tokenism, and it is largely intended to please the public back where you have been elected, not the public where you are working in terms of development and, and reconstruction efforts or even conflict resolution. So I'll stop here and I'll come back in the question. Thank after. you, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Before I turn to Rafaela, let me just remind everybody that you can ask questions, I guess, by scanning the QR codes and um, we'll have a chance uh, to come to you and present your questions. Rafaela, as, as Chargé d'Affaires uh, of the European Union to Afghanistan, um, you've also had experience in Syria, Morocco, Palestine. Palestine. Um, yeah, so please talk to us and perhaps in particular about Afghanistan. And I should say that we had one of our um, uh, episodes in the Hiwarat series was on Afghanistan and on breaking the impasse and obviously um, uh, women under the rule of the Taliban and women's education in particular uh, and I know you're involved also with the um, American University of Afghanistan and its presence over here anyway talk to us First of all, uh, thank you. I have to thank you personally, and of course, my friend, colleague, sister, Andrula, for the invitation. 
I, I had uh, many points prepared on the beauty of the European Union, on gender policy, on feminist policy, but I think I skip all of them. We had a lot of conversation already on this. I, I just would like to say a few words. As, as you mentioned, I am in Kabul. I live in Kabul since two years. I came today from Kabul, 26 hours, so I'm a little bit sleepy, solely because of Dubai floods. I spent the night in the airport. But I really wanted to come today. Why? Uh, and, and the link is, is uh, with what I want to say. For me, uh, today was really important to be here, and I go back to Kabul tomorrow, to give a little bit the vision of somebody who's still a diplomat. I'm the only so-called Western diplomat in Afghanistan, one of the few who go around. I've been twice in Iraq, in Kandahar, Bamiyan, and, and everywhere. And uh, also as a, as a female diplomat, apart from the UN, I'm the, among the diplomatic community, again, I'm the only woman. So it's not to play the hero, but just to give the voice to the women that I talk to in Afghanistan. And to also maybe to this constituency to, to give you some, some points, but I will not go beyond the five minutes now, I will expand about challenges, but also opportunities. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, um, when people ask me, why are you there? Or I have a lot of insults, by the way. I, I think every time there's a tweet where I'm covered and I visit somewhere as if I could go around in Kabul in a miniskirt, which I would know where anyway, but anyway, I, I, I don't answer, obviously. But I also know I take the strengths from these women. Women that we treat like sometimes retarded person who need our protection. The strongest women I saw in my 34 years uh, career in only conflict areas are the Afghan women. And the women in Afghanistan, I tell you, they need our support, but they don't need to be treated like, you know, oh, good girl, I'm going to throw you food. Same probably for girls and other countries. Now I'm talking. So um, today uh, I have, uh, I wanted to say, in Afghanistan is uh, almost a forgotten crisis. There are too many things we draw the attention and that's why again, it's really so important to talk about it. And today funds uh, are, are running away and uh, nobody wants to, to talk about Afghanistan for uh, we are as Europeans, I'm very proud to say we came back immediately, we stayed there. We continue our funding 360 million last year, only in grants, excluding our member states. And why do we do it? We have a principal position. We talk to women. We had the famous red lines, but with culture sensitivity. This is the trick in Afghanistan. When you work on Afghanistan, when you're there and these women tell you, you're like a person between two walls. <laughs> Everybody, I'm sorry, this is not very diplomatic, is as stubborn on one side as on the other. And uh, dialogue is, is the only way in the culture sensitivity. So what are the challenges? I will, I will just say the title and then we will go for the question and thing. We have uh, challenges, uh, of course, in education. It goes without saying. But we have also pockets of hope. I saw schools. I saw girls in schools. I know why we should support, for example, primary, primary education. I visited the other day a cancer institute, the only one in... Uh, are you aware that in Afghanistan there's not a mammography uh, machine? Not one. So when somebody from outside tweets and say, why are you putting funds in Afghanistan? You help the Taliban. Sorry, Shell. Do financing a mammography machine uh, helps the Taliban? Do they have, sorry, <laughs> whatever. I mean, so you see, this is, this is my fight uh, every day to understand that we don't, we don't forget the principle while we help the people. Economic rights are linked to also human rights. Of course, leadership, inclusion, Afghan women often are forgotten. They were forgotten also before the Taliban. I was checking 22% only um, of the different negotiations since 2001 included women. So, you know, the original sinners were. 
I have a ton of other things, but uh, well, how do we do? How do we work? How do we talk about migration, climate change? Afghan women are the first victim. I, contrary to my colleagues, I will keep the time for, for the rest and we'll answer to, to the thank question. You. Thank, thank you. you. Ayala, thank you. And we look forward to um, coming back to you. Um, Nada, there's, you know, your counselor uh, at the permanent um, mission of Palestine at the UN um, in Geneva. Um, in Geneva, I think I said New York earlier. Um, I've, okay. Um, I've seen you sometimes, I think, um, commenting from New York, perhaps, at least that's what I'm going to stick with because I already uh, <laughs> butchered one introduction earlier. Um, you have spoken a lot. I know that you um, have been particularly focused on the lack of implementation of international agreements uh, to protect women um, in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, in Gaza in particular, we have seen not only the devastation in terms of the killing of women and children, um, but also the particular challenges facing um, women, I mean, you know, women's reproductive health, um, uh, women's ability to care for their um, infants, um, and, you know, where is the world on all of this? So please share with us um, what you will about sort of the impact, the differentiated impact of the genocide on Gaza and what I uh, also think of in terms of the slow genocide that's been going on in the West Bank and East Jerusalem over the past months, but also over the past years, and 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 the the uh, impact on women there. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dean Masri. And first of all, allow me to express my appreciation to you and to Georgetown Qatar for inviting me to speak on this important panel, and to everyone in the audience for their participation. So let me just start by saying that I would like to dedicate my introductory words to the Palestinian women and girls who have endured so much, whose stories are often ignored by the Western media, who have had to face decades of settler colonial violence, occupation, apartheid, and now genocide with little external support, and who have remained steadfast in their refusal to submit to these conditions. Israel's assault on Palestinian women's dignity and rights, as you mentioned, is long-standing. But in this intervention, given the time constraints, I will limit myself as much as possible to the current situation. So as you all know, over the past six months, Israel has dropped has launched one of the most sustained and intense bombing campaigns of a populated area in history in Gaza and dropped more than 65,000 tons of explosives, killing nearly 34,000 people. 73% of those killed were children and women and the elderly. More than 14,000 children and more than 10,000 women have been killed. And among the women killed are 6,000 mothers. Two mothers are estimated to be killed every hour in Gaza. Women killed have included sisters, grandmothers, wives, widows as well. They have included journalists, medical staff, nurses, ambulance workers, UN staff, members of civil society organizations, artists, aid workers, and the list goes on. And more than 76,000 people have been injured in Gaza, most of them women and children. So UN Women has described the war in Gaza as a war on women. Other UN officials have described it as a war on children, with one child killed every 10 minutes. The truth is that it is a war on the population as a whole. But And the scope of what Israel is doing in Gaza is more than what the mind can grasp, and I won't go into statistics because I think all of you know them. But while the atrocities affect both women and men, the impact of Israel's genocidal assault has been disproportionately grinding for women and girls. 
most of the approximately 1 million women who have survived have been displaced from their homes, fleeing under relentless bombardment. They have been forced to shelter in cramped schools, hospitals, churches, mosques, tents, exposing them to unhygienic conditions and the spread of disease and epidemics. There they have almost no access to food, safe drinking water, functioning toilets, running water or sanitary pads as a result of the complete siege illegally imposed by Israel on Gaza. And the situation is particularly dire for the estimated 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza. Lack of access to clean water has forced them to drink salty water or contaminated water. And lack of food and proper nutrition has led to significant weight loss. And this, when you compound it with the shock and stress of constant bombs, has led to a rate of miscarriages that has increased up to 300% and premature births up to 30%. And in the meantime, Israel continues to target hospitals, doctors, nurses, patients, and the healthcare system in Gaza has collapsed, with not one hospital left that is fully operational. So as a result, every day, approximately 180 pregnant women are being forced to give birth in inhumane, degrading conditions, often with no medical help, without basic supplies like pain relief or sanitary precautions. Babies are being born on the ground, in the streets, amid rubble, in tents and shelters, umbilical cords cut with whatever sharp object is available. And for women who do manage to walk, walk to the barely functioning remaining health centers or hospitals, C-sections are being performed without anesthesia or sterilization, without antibiotics or postnatal care. So when, I mean, I'm just going to give you a bit more of the description because I think this is important. When babies are born, nursing mothers are struggling to produce milk to breastfeed their babies. Premature and underweight babies have little to no chance of survival. Some have been found decomposing in their hospital cots because medical staff had to evacuate. Mothers have been writing the names of their children on different parts of the children's bodies, hands, legs, torsos, in case they are blown up and their corpses found strewn in multiple parts. As UNICEF put it, becoming a mother should be a time for celebration. In Gaza, it's another child born into hell. And Israel has even targeted, I just saw this news a few minutes ago, a fertility clinic in Gaza. It targeted it in December. And now it has been found that Israel destroyed more than 4,000 embryos and 1,000 more specimens of sperm and under unfertilized eggs. So you're talking about 5,000 lives or potential lives, the only hope for hundreds of Palestinian couples facing infertility destroyed in a single blast. So as argued in South Africa's case against Israel before the International Court of Justice, it is clear that these systematic attacks on the reproductive rights of Palestinian women and their newborns are meant to serve genocidal goals of preventing births among the Palestinian population. And I could go on and on listing the violations, the fact that Palestinian women have to use plastic bags or tent scraps as sanitary pads, the fact that Palestinian women and children are being extrajudicially killed while seeking refuge or fleeing, some with single sniper shots to the head found, about female patients found in mass graves still with medical bandages and catheters attached to their dead bodies, about women and girls being subject to enforced disappearance and arbitrary detention, or Israeli soldiers posting countless photos on social media posing with the lingerie and underwear of displaced or dead Palestinian women. And I could talk to you at length about the fact that since the start of Israel's occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza nearly 57 years ago, more than 10,000 Palestinian women have been arrested or detained by Israel. And there are countless stories of girls brutalized, uh, subject to torture, isolation, sexual violence, and rape. But what Palestinian women and girls have had to endure doesn't end here. And here I would like to go back to the point made by Professor Sultan Barakat. They have to endure the hypocrisy and silence of many in the international community. And this is arguably one of the most difficult and hurtful aspects to swallow because we thought we were living in a more progressive time. 
we had been encouraged over the past decades by the fact that more and more people were acknowledging and speaking out about the need to uphold the rights of women and girls and protect them from violence in armed conflict. Yet violence continues to be perpetrated against Palestinian women and girls at an appalling scale with complete impunity and with the complicity of silent or silence of a large number of states who claim to have feminist foreign policies or support and champion the women, peace and security agenda. And these states have shown little empathy for the plight of these women. For example, I, I mean, and prominent, prominent feminists as well, who are otherwise vocal on other uh, other violations against women. For example, feminist icon Hillary Clinton had more to say about the lack of Oscar nomination for Margot Robbie's role in Barbie than about women and girls being killed in Gaza at the rate of two mothers per hour and one child every 10 minutes. In fact, her contribution to the debate on Gaza was to object to calls for a ceasefire that would have saved countless women and girls. The Biden administration's democratic campaign is running on support for women's rights and reproductive justice at home while enabling the assault on reproductive rights in Gaza by supplying the arms that are being used to pummel Gaza. The conspicuous silence on the suffering of Palestinian women, particularly from Western states and a large number of self-proclaimed feminists, and the refusal to endorse calls for an immediate ceasefire or stop the transfer of arms brings into question the real commitment of these states and these individuals to the values they proclaim to have. And this does not bode well for the future of humanity. Indeed, if the atrocities against Palestinian women and girls are allowed to continue and the double standards continue, the credibility of the women, peace and security agenda and of international law and the multilateral system more broadly may suffer a tremendous blow that it might be impossible to recover from and send the message that women's lives and rights are expendable. And to conclude, let me say that states and individuals who claim to stand up for women's rights now have a choice. Either they stand up for women's rights universally, including Palestinian women and girls under brutal Israeli oppression, and call for a ceasefire and an end to the status quo of structural and institutionalized colonial and racist violence against them, or they admit their double standards openly and honestly say that their commitment to protect women and girls in conflict situations come only in politically convenient cases, but not when egregious crimes are committed against Palestinian women and girls. And if they admit that, then they can no longer call themselves feminists because they are not. So for those truly well-intentioned, it is not too late to do the right thing and be uncompromising in truth-telling to break their silence on Palestine. We are not asking anyone to be pro-Palestinian, simply to be pro-international law, pro the commitments they themselves have elaborated, to be really pro-women, pro-humanity, and pro-peace. And I thank you for your attention. Look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. Thank you. Um, it's it's heartbreaking to hear this, even though we know it. But it's really just heartbreaking to be reminded of it. Let me stay with with you, Nada, for a minute, and then I'll go to the other panelists with other questions. Uh, my question to you is, and and you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're not asking anybody to be pro-Palestinian, and I would even say not even to be pro-woman, just pro-human really just pro-human um yes. pro-human life um and you don't have to be a feminist to be defending women's uh, rights women's reproductive rights to be uh, protecting women protecting infants and we didn't get into and maybe now is not the right forum to get into sort of the intent behind Israel's barbarity targeted towards women and and children. Uh, but let me ask you this. What are some of the short to medium term measures that you and others are working on? And then in the long run, what is your um, perspective on the ability to bring about justice and accountability not just about sort of the genocidal war on Gaza, uh, but in particular um, on this very important dimension 
of the genocide. Um, if I can ask you to comment on those two things quickly, I'd appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. So in terms of um, our efforts, they have been consistent. Uh, we have been trying to convince our people for the past 30 years that through peaceful means, through legality and legal avenues like the United Nations and the International Court of Justice and the ICC and so on, we will be able to bring about liberation from occupation, colonization and apartheid. And we have been counting on the international community to help us demonstrate to our people that these means work. And we continue to do so. Just today, there will be a, a resolution of the Security Council on membership of Palestine um, in the United Nations. Uh, but, you know, we're expecting a U.S. veto. And indeed, uh, unfortunately, the international community, particularly Israel's unconditional allies, have reacted to our attempts to use peaceful and legal means to, to further our rights through obstacles at every turn. Countless UN Security Council vetoes, attempts to block our efforts in international courts, the criminalization of efforts by civil society to engage in nonviolent boycott, divestment and sanctions, the criminalization of legitimate criticism of the grave breaches of a state, Israel, as anti-Semitic. So we, we will not give up on international law. We will keep pushing, but what we are pushing as well is for states to become more responsible. We need to remind them of their obligations under international law and of the fact that if they keep on having these double standards, they are putting the whole international system in jeopardy, which does not bode well for anyone in the future. So, you know, this is this is all we can do. Um, I know that another aspect is this whole idea that maybe perhaps having more women in decision-making positions would help bring about a more peaceful world. And of course, as Palestine, we, we very much support uh, these efforts. And Palestine is the only country in the region that has ratified the SIDAO, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, without any reservations. So, the, you know, and, and so we believe in this, but at the same time, let me just make one point since we're on a panel about gender, is that we have been extremely disappointed by women in, uh, in uh, decision-making positions in many places, uh, especially in Western countries, who don't seem to uh, have a more um, measured approach towards Palestine, but are perpetuating uh, the old approach of dehumanization of Palestinians. I mean, let me just give you a few examples, if if that's okay. Yes. Please. Um, womenness did not stop the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, from consistently dehumanizing Palestinians. It did not stop U.S. ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield, from repeatedly raising her hand to veto a ceasefire in Gaza. Which, was, which is a move tantamount to a death sentence to thousands of Palestinian women and girls. Womenness did not stop uh, UK Home Secretary Suela Braverman from incendiary rhetoric and smearing of peaceful pro-ceasefire protesters. And I could go on about Nikki Haley's genocidal language against Palestinians and so on. So what we want to advocate more for is, yes, more women, but more importantly, more people with principles principles would have stopped these things. Moral integrity, values, courage, um, uncompromising uh, commitment to, to the right, to what is right. Instead, we see a number of female politicians in power, just like their male counterparts, caring more about furthering their careers or acting on the basis of political convenience rather than peace, international law, empathy, and humanity. So this is just to say that uh, for us, uh, on our side, we will continue pushing through peaceful and legal means. And we are hoping that in the world, uh, in governments, especially with influence on the future of Palestine, we will see not only more women, but more people who are principled and more people who are responsible and think about the long term um, the interests of humanity as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. And more people to see Palestinians, I mean, in order to be able to humanize them. Uh, Ambassador, I'm going to turn to you and ask you more or less 
A similar question that I just asked uh, Nada. The, I mean, first, and we spoke about this yesterday briefly, you and I, the, the uh, support for Ukraine uh, by Western countries, and uh, it's fair to say that it's not as strong as it was a while ago. Um, if you agree with that, how is this specifically impacting the issues facing women and um, what are you and other diplomats trying to do to bring focus at least and continue or even improve support that helps protect women um, in the in the in the current situation uh, <clears throat> thank you it's a very interesting question actually uh, you know that due to the rules of informational society, each news still living for two weeks. Then it degrading in the ratings and then going to nail, to zero. Uh, we have, what, 10 years. It was uh, very weak attempts to assist Ukraine from the very beginning. It was... Uh, talks about non-lethal weapons, uh, all this abstract call for ceasefires, for uh, abstention from the use of forces. Then uh, the full-scale war actually started, and started uh, not at the last, uh, due to the weak reaction of the world society, and we were at the first uh, front pages. Then uh, this news went down, and fortunately, fortunately, I would like to emphasize that uh, for the long period we were enjoying the assistance uh, of our um, main the Western alliance, uh, assistance in the issues of weapons, armament, and uh, everything which could help Ukraine to win. Uh, a lot of uh, measures are non-public, but the mainstream still the same. Uh, right now, and especially after the certain event here in this uh, region, uh, the U.S. Congress has woken up, and uh, we expect the next package of the assistance to Ukraine to be voted positively this Saturday. How it uh, help us? Uh, first of all, it reduce the death toll of the Ukrainians, including the female at the uh, front line. Uh, we were talking about 62,000, uh, and you were asking about me the total number, which is actually the uh, secret of uh, no. any army. But, uh, but I would I, say I, this is about... I tried, at least. Uh, <laughs> this is about eight... 9% of all the uh, militaries right now currently busy uh, in the war. We also have uh, a lot of cases of absolutely self-sufficient uh, and heroical attitude of uh, the ladies at the front line. Uh, unlikely we also have uh, the absolutely disgusting cases of the women as a prisoners of war mm -hmm. some of them are more for two years as the russian you know military prisons despite the promises to release them immediately about 90 percent of them were raped were violated they have the physical degradation due to the low calorie diets just few bowl of soups without meat without uh, bread just something like that. You can see the, uh, let's say, Second World War, the how pictures uh, of the Ukrainian prisoners of war. What we are doing as the diplomats, we are trying to make these cases uh, seen. Uh, we would like, we are uh, continuing, continuing all possible endeavors to receive assistance for Ukraine. Why it is so important? In fact, uh, having the supremacy of Russia in the missiles, actually they haven't inherited the Russian, uh, the Soviet uh, missiles potential, and Ukraine was so careless 
that we have we gave rid our nuclear weapons including the missiles including the bombers including the strategic bombers they still have yeah so each and any inch of the ukrainian territory is now under the threat of the potential attack oh. of the russians and that is why we need to receive something abroad yeah. And uh, the role of the uh, Ukrainian diplomacy is extremely high for yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Rafaela, let me turn to you. I mean, girls' education, right? We cannot talk about gender and women's role in, in foreign affairs and in diplomacy um, if we don't have um, women accessing education can we have even an educated society of men if you don't have educated women, right? I mean, an, an uneducated mother mm-hmm. means that you have not only uneducated girls, but you have uneducated boys also growing in the, in the household. Um, what can we do? What are you doing? What is the EU attempting to do to try to address this issue? Uh, well, uh, of course, you are, you are totally right. The issue of women and girls' education, in particular stopping the secondary education, is the most dramatic issue that uh, we have to tackle, you as everybody. I think if there's one thing which unifies the international community, you can be Muslim, Italian, or uh, or Qatari, or whatever, or non-Muslim, we all agree that that's a non-go. So, um, first of all, um, I I do very much believe, and as you, but not only as you, I have to say, uh, many of us are financing primary education. Because uh, if you want boycotting the primary because of the secondary is just adding even more. Sure. Because primary education is is equally important for boys and girls. These are the future men and uh, not sending them to school with uh, the between brackets reason that uh, we don't want to channel funds in the country uh, will only make this, uh, this, uh, this country very more radical. So we are uh, trying to do what we can to support uh, female teacher, girls, uh, primary school. I often go to primary schools where I see these girls all with big hopes and uh, really this breaks your heart too. I want to say it is not only war. This is a war. It's a war against girls. It's a war against humanity as well. Uh, at the same time, when it comes to uh, second education, I don't have to, to say to anybody, I mean, it's clear the edict is there. But uh, there again, uh, um, the interest in Afghanistan and the difficulty in Afghanistan, especially when you go around, is that there's not uh, a homogeneous Afghanistan. When you go to Bamiyan, the situation, including on education, might be different than Kandahar. Well, it is different. So there again, uh, uh, many donors try to continue, at least when they can, to have online teaching, which uh, initially, when I was there two years ago, for me, was also a little bit controversial because I thought if we start sending all the girls uh, uh, online, we just close all the schools and, you know, they are really in a prison. But then uh, there, uh, you have to deal with what you have, right. and that's uh, that's very important. There are, there are a number of people that they do with that. We are also supporting vocational training. I have to say something. 30% of girls did not go to school even before 2021. So it's not that we start with a country that had the full education for everybody. That's uh, I think we have to go back at least to a reality check which doesn't in any way, form, or shape justify, of course, the ban on education. What is uh, even uh, more difficult, and I do, as you know, have uh, almost daily contact with the fact authorities within the, the, the mandate I have, which is uh, fixed by our European Council. And every time, of course, I raise this, but we always try to, in our dialogue, and uh, at least open to the dialogue, at least bilaterally, uh, we always tackle the issue of education from uh, something which is very practical. Who will take care of your daughters? Who are then future doctors? The impact on, on the economy, the impact of this on education. So um, 
There are a number of activities. I, of course, some activities are more public than others, but I see a strong will also from some of the authorities mm. to go back somehow. There's not an homogeneous picture. Yeah. Not yeah. everybody, especially, is, is a totally, many of them also tell me bilaterally, but not only to me, to whoever right. comes and talk to them, right. we're finding a solution. Of course, uh, it's uh, in Egyptian filmish mish. It might be a filmish mish solution, but I think uh, the presence and the conversation, the daily reminder of the impact on them. My point to them is, right. it's not because I'm a human right. that I ask you, it's because it's, just yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. I mean, that resonates with some of the discussions we had at the um, Afghanistan conference that we held back in, uh, I think it was October. And that is that there was, to a large extent, consensus that you need to work within the system. Yeah. You need to work with the Taliban on the, you know, if, it, if it's seen sort of as an imposed agenda. Yeah especially by the West, it's going to be rejected. And there's a lot of Agreed. history to celebrate in Afghanistan, um, you know, before the uh, 1970s and, 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 and since, um, there was sort of a tradition of great education and great women's education and women's participation in society. So working within the system yeah. um, is what I'm hearing you say. Um, Sultan, I would like you to take it in any direction that you'd like to take it because I've seen you, um, you know, write attentively, pick up on certain things. So comment on what you've heard from our colleagues and then I'll turn to some questions from the audience. Okay. Let me complete my thought earlier. <laughs> well, I, um, I said what I said because I obviously believe strongly in the need for that natural state to to exist everywhere men and women are equal access to resources access to opportunities everything has got to be there but we have to put a lot of thinking on the how our problem is in the application how do we do it and how long are we going to take to reach that uh, that target the problem with conflict is that it de-develop countries and often our responses to the conflict helps accelerate that de-development de by us making them dependent on our humanitarian assistance and our models and our values and so on. Uh, for example, now the situation in Afghanistan, the biggest challenge in the country used to be security. Now the Taliban have largely resolved the issue of security. This is why you're able to travel. This is why the primary enrollment, boys and girls have gone up in Afghanistan for the first time under the Taliban now because security is no longer an issue. A mother can send her daughter or son to school and expect them back. They did not used to, to have that. Then we come from the outside and we impose a blanket sanction system that affects men and women. The very target that I heard earlier in Canada, for example, that they do gender audit on the programs. So you identify there are women, as a dresser, but we still sanction the women alongside the men, knowing 100% that when the Taliban say, I don't want the woman in the street, the woman does not disappear. She goes back in her backyard, she goes in the back room, and she does her little work, whatever she was doing before, particularly in the aftermath of war, where many, many women have become household heads, not by choice. Someone has killed the husband, she got divorced, etc. So they don't have the break. They don't, nobody comes to them and says, well, you're no longer responsible for the family. She's responsible and she has to work privately, but she is sanctioned like everybody else. She does not have access to a bank account. The iBank cannot work, et cetera, et cetera. We need to have more smart targeted sanctions. If we are to introduce, and this is what I was saying that the liberals amongst us think of all this wonderful gender stuff but then the hawks come and say, oh, well, you have just to have, this is everybody. But it doesn't work like that. Same with private schools. When they stopped them from going to schools, uh, the majority did not just sit at home. They started to do neighborhood-based private schools. But these needs resources. They need to yeah. be supported by scholarships. We have uh, 
the most fantastic forum that works is chaired by a woman and it has Taliban sits in it called Afghanistan Future Thought Forum. You know the woman, I think, who chairs it. Uh, simply because she speaks their language, you know, not just the la actual language, but, you know, she understands how they respond, how they, what she expects from them and so on. We need, we need to do uh, much more of that. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I think the issue of double standards after Gaza, a lot of these, even us who are, were motivated, so we lost that, you know, the wind in our uh, sails. <laughs> because of Gaza. Gaza has been a disaster. Uh, the ambassador talked about how the Congress is going to pass the aid to Ukraine. It's because it got entangled with Israel and the Israel is now justified because of the Iranian attack, which was totally, uh, did not harm. You know, there's, there are things going on much bigger than us with a good will can, can do. And I think this is why we need to be wiser. We need to find mechanisms, ways, similar to what we heard this morning at the individual level, how they managed to challenge their circumstances as individual women ambassadors to be able to achieve higher grounds. That has got to be developed into and integrated into our policy, I think, in the long run. Yeah, yeah. Um, Inada, I'm going to turn to you and take one, or maybe I'll try to actually weave in a couple of questions from the audience. And there's time also for anybody who wants to ask questions. Um, there's one question that comes um, that basically says, uh, you know, to go back to what we were saying earlier, what you were saying about how disappointing it is, particularly when you have women in powerful positions, um, not humanizing Palestinians and Palestinian women in particular, and you um, uh, mentioned a couple of them. Um, how do we get to have women advocating better for women and 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 um and and you know as i don't want to contradict myself because what i said earlier you don't only need women advocating for women you need men and women advocating for women and we need to all be pro-human right as opposed to pro-palestinian or pro-women how do we get there and then somebody asked a question um as Sudanese, Palestinian, Afghan, Ukrainian women, how do we move forward after these conflicts? How can we be heard? And I'm going to um, add to that question and say, how do we get heard as women and men during the conflict? Because we don't even see the end, unfortunately, in sight yet. So I know lots of issues here and and um they're a bit complex and interwoven but but your thoughts on any of the above uh nada yeah thank you so much for these very interesting questions i think on the question of how to get more women to to um uh, show feminist solidarity with women from the global south including women in palestine we first need to ask ourselves the question why is there such apathy or lack of solidarity when it comes to the stories and the struggles of palestinian women and girls and i think there are several answers to this um i don't think it's ignorance the genocide in gaza is being televised its details are graphic and also, the 75 years of crimes committed against Palestinians have been very well documented. So it is willful blindness. And we must ask ourselves why if we are to try to resolve this problem. I think that first, there is a tendency um, by some Western feminists to perceive Palestinian women like Arab, which who they tend to amalgamate with all Arab women or all Muslim women. And, and to consider as a monolith, as being oppressed primarily by their culture, uh, by conservative societies, and so on. So they, try, they tend to miss the point that the main source of oppression is the structural oppression under which these women live. Um, and uh, so, so, for example, you'll have some Western feminists celebrating women rem removing their headscarves, which they view as a tool of oppression, but stay completely silent on mothers or children being killed at the hands of Israel 
often with the diplomatic, financial and military support of their governments. Uh, or, I mean, I have to bring this up because it, it's uh, it's very much in the news. They may advocate for the amplica- amplification of voices of Muslim women in Muslim countries. And at the same time, like we're seeing at the University of Southern California, silence a Muslim hijab wearing valedictorian for her views on Palestine. Uh, so there are serious uh you know, th- this is serious. I think that we have to remember that women's rights cannot be fulfilled under colonial occupation and apartheid. So what women need to realize is that Palestinian women are oppressed primarily not by their own societies, but by Israel. And that without ending the six, 76 years of dispossession and subjugation, 57 years of occupation and 17 years of illegal blockade and chronic impunity for these violations, Palestinian women will not be able to fulfill their rights. And I have to say in that in that regard, Palestine is a feminist issue. Calling for an end to the occupation is a feminist prerogative. And uh, ending the condition uh, under which Palestinian women continue to face these violations is a must. Um, but but here I, I have to make one more Im- important point, which is that while Palestine is a feminist issue and it is a reproductive rights issue, we cannot just reduce it to um, a, to an issue of gender because Palestinian men are also dehumanized. They are also under colonial occupation, apartheid and genocide, and they are also being tortured and uh, and uh, is subject to all kinds of war crimes and crimes against humanity. So, you know, we need to just be careful to always remember that this is a dehumanization of a, of a population as a whole. And yes, Palestinian women and girls are disproportionately affected, but we cannot forget the children, the women, the journalists, the aid workers, and all other groups that are uh, being subject to um to, to crimes and violations. And as to your second question, which is how do we move forward or how do we get, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian women to be heard um, or women in the global south in general? I think, um, you know, we, we just have to basically keep raising awareness about the situation. I think there is um, a shift at the moment, a generational shift in the world with the, the younger generation, especially much more aware of the conditions under which Palestinian women are living. And we're seeing that uh, the more people are aware of what's happening, the more they reject it. Um, so so this is something we need to keep doing. And also to, to have forums such as the one we're having today uh, and invite Palestinian voices and make sure that um, they are part of the conversation. So thanks again for having me. Thank you, Nada. Thank you. And and I mean it, I said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, we're very fortunate to have your voice uh, among those voices. Um, so other questions that have come in from, from the audience, maybe we'll, we'll go around and and, and uh, with one. Um, so how can we ensure that the voices and needs of gender minorities are included and prioritized specifically in conflict resolution and peace building processes? Um, you talked about the process, um, uh, Sultan, you talked about sort of, you know, ensuring that these things are institutionalized. How do we go about doing that? Oh, gosh. If I, if I just knew, um, I think the first mistake is mixing gender with minorities. Okay. Yeah. There is th- this minorities yeah. is something. We are not yeah. a minority. But yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just can't resist this majority. Yeah. <laughs> no. no I'm, I'm t- in terms of political uh, right. scenes that we, we have, we, we don't have women fighting men. Right. In, in Afghanistan, we have a, a government that's trying to dominate certain minorities. Their issues, their concerns are different, men and women and so on. So I think that would be the starting point. And this is what I was saying earlier, that we sometimes package all our values together and try and throw it at them. By the time it arrives, it arrives confused. And uh, they cannot, they're not all received in, with the same enthusiasm. Uh, the other thing, I think, is to move away from tokenism. 
tokenism. I mean, tokenism to please our audience, not to please them. Mm. No one in Kabul was sitting there counting how many women are on the negotiation team. The questions were coming from Washington, from London, from pressure groups, Afghan women who have left the country already and probably have no interest to go back. That's, that was a problem. Uh, linked to those, to, to the uh, voices, I think, it's very important to try and, and reach the voices that matter, the people that uh, uh, you probably see on daily basis in, in Afghanistan and give them the priority now ahead of those voices that had already left the country and have no intention to go back. But they're very loud, they have access to social media, they have access to parliaments, and uh, they're quite critical. Uh, Ten days ago, I wrote a very critical article of the Taliban and their approach to education, because now it is the third year of the promise that they will do something about it. I did not get a single objection I usually get from the Taliban leaders. I got all the objections from the uh, feminists who are uh, supposed to support my argument they thought I was doing this as an act to protect the Taliban, that I'm cr- critiquing them now for the sake of, I don't know, improving their, their image. Uh, we need to use our arguments based on our shared culture and religion and understanding with them. Islam is very, very clear. If you do not read, you cannot worship. The first f- f- phrase that came to the Prophet says, Iqra, read. You cannot read, you cannot become a Muslim, you cannot really do what, you, what is expected of you. And then it goes to talk to men and women, so it expects both to be able to be literate so that they can worship. And it's a bit like you know, taking someone in Ramadan and forcing him or her to eat if you take them away from education. That, it's as simple as that. This is why foundations, universities have always been created by, by women. I mean, they're, it's a very important, this is going back to why Women matter, they educate a generation. You know, if you look at all the big famous institutions, the Al Azhar and Kairawan, all of this, they were started by endowment by women. I mean, we are here now, thanks to a woman who made all this dream come I true. So, so it, is, it is fundamental to our existence, but that argument, we don't have space for it. We don't really take it uh, with, with the other sides. And we you know 100% that what prevent the minority of the Taliban, for example, and I'm sorry to pick up on Afghanistan, but um, the minority who are against women education, it's a very small minority. Yeah. And they are not against it because of Islam or they're using Islamic uh, excuses. It is, it is a very specific tribal culture of a small minority that happen now to be of an of a important position relevant to the leader. The leader needs them to protect his position. And all the uh, decisions that have been made on education are, are not black or white. They're all gray. So it doesn't say no education. It says we'll postpone it, we'll think, and so on. And that reflects the nature of the leadership that exists at the moment, which is um, a compromise shura type arrangement. Now, that should not stop us from keeping on trying, because I think that is a phase that they will move out of, ultimately, the more stable the country the more pressure these people will come under. So we, we, conti- we need to continue doing it. And I think we in this region carry a particular responsibility. We should not leave it for the West to continue to interpret and develop those concepts and export them to East. We should really play a very active role here. And I'm pleased to see, obviously, you know, Georgetown in Doha is a, very, is a perfect example to be the bridge in terms of this joint understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan. It was very, um, very important. And like you said, very important to sort of distinguish between minority status, if you will, perhaps, and minority, I mean, sorry, between uh, oppression and, um, you know, minority as, as, as it might imply otherwise. Um, I like where you ended also in terms of we have to take it upon ourselves in the region and reminding us all that those who use religion and Islam in particular to justify the suppression of women are actually misusing uh, and abusing um, religion for that purpose. Um, It is about patriarchy. It's about sort of a tradition of oppression, of suppression 
um, of, uh, of, of men um, coming out on top. And frankly, uh, there's a lot that can be learned from this region about a woman's role in yeah. society. And thank you for reminding us also of the role of women in Qatar in particular. Um, so, any response to that, Rafaela? I mean, you know, anything that you can take from oh, I, what you I, just heard? I, I, as usual, I, I agree with uh, with Sultan, but I would not th that you have a role, and that's what uh, the Afghan people tell us. At least the one I meet, uh, the region has a key role. The OIC has a role. Muslim because they misuse the religion. This minority also within the Taliban, I think, by right. the way. Uh, but I think the real change comes from within Afghanistan. Yeah. And that's where I link with what we, but not all, we all do also. Right. We should give the means to them without imposing, without coming and telling them what to do. We saw the sure. results of input in position, but also we should keep alive this pocket of, uh, of hope, pocket of development, because we are not uh, 20 years ago. Right. Everybody has access. We spoke before digitalization, even in the most remote areas, everybody, I, almost everybody has a phone even right. in Afghanistan. And that's where I do very be much believe that we, as international community, and also as between brackets Westerns, we have to be patient. We can't go there and say change everything tomorrow. And we cannot tell them to and change everything. And we cannot everything. just pip, uh, pack and go. Yeah. Because this will come back. Right. We have to give them the means. And that's what women tell us. Right. Please, don't forget, even if we are a little bit of a burden on your shoulder. Right. Be patient. Don't fight from outside. Yeah. Right. Work with. And argue from within. I mean, I... Mm. Um, when I studied, Tracy, you mentioned the Tunisia when you were, um, as an example, and when I studied Tunisia, one of the things that I found fascinating is in advancing women's rights, Habib Bourguiba, the first yeah. president of Tunisia, who in 1956, the moment Tunisia was liberated from the French, um, he instituted the court, the statut yeah. um, personnel, the, the family code that advanced women's rights in Tunisia in certain respects more advanced than they are in any Arab country today in certain respects um, he did not impose it um, on society he worked with the ulama of Al Zaytuna mosque and argued from within Islam uh, and he had a mastery of Islam and, and the theological teachings and so on and so forth. Um, and that proved to be incredibly effective um, in advancing um, advancing the role, uh, the, the rights of women and thus the role of women. Um, any thoughts? I know you have to leave momentarily to deal with a, okay, but, but any, any concluding thoughts, Ambassador? Well, uh, first of all, we are the people of the United Nations. This is the first line of the UN Charter. And as a people of United Nations, we are equally eager in the secure, prosperous, and safe future. Notwithstanding gender, notwithstanding nation, notwithstanding the religion and notwithstanding countries. Uh, unfortunately, this is still a dream. Since uh, just this stage comprises four cases of uh, uh, drama, human's drama, which uh, should not have happened in the 21st century. Uh, and these are, sorry, but these are only four of... Only not four only, from I mean, the but, multiple, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, for that reason, uh, for that reason, uh, the humanity should be united. United around the shared values. Uh, and uh, it is absolutely impossible uh, to continue in the 21st century, new colonial 
policy, the policy of war, the policy of genocide, notwithstanding the country it applied to. Uh, this is something which the world should uh, work at. But uh, the uh, aggression against Ukraine in 2010 has shown that the international uh, system of check and balances, international legal system, international system of the inter well, the system of the international organization, extremely weak, and uh, in fact can do in nothing. Uh, well, of course, I will be talking about my case. Uh, it is clearly understandable that uh, the country which commits terror and genocide is sitting in the Security Council of the United Nations. Why I'm mentioning this? We need to work. We need to restore the respect for the basic uh, human uh, values and basic interest. Uh, we have the only life. There is no another life, at least in this material world, just for us. And we have to make it peaceful, at least, if not for us, but for our kids. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Neda, um, I'm going to give you the floor to make any concluding remarks that you would like to make. Um, nothing specific, just to thank you again, Dean Masri and Georgetown and uh, and for all the participants in the questions. I thought it was a very insightful um, uh, debate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. Um, so we've learned so much, I think, from this session. And if you'll allow me, I'll try to capture um, a few, uh, at least what I'm walking away with. And then we'll do the same maybe for the other panels as we conclude, and I'll ask the panelists to stay in their seats and Nada for you to stay on uh, with us as we do this. But um, we've covered really so much. And uh, Ambassador, um, your passion um, is very, very clear. And uh, you know we're with you. And, and um, I think the grave crimes perpetrated by the Russian army, uh, particularly on sexual violence, um, are something that the world needs to know more about. Yeah. Um, Sultan, thank you uh, for your nuanced um, insights about a variety of things, and I think the importance of uh, the importance of cultural sensi sensitivity um, really came through. Um, and uh, Rafaela. Um, you're doing incredibly important work uh, where you are, and so we really commend you for that and anything that we can do to help, particularly in the field of education, uh, we'd love to do that. Um, Nada, keep on doing the great work that you're doing, really, and I think continue to uh, give voice to Palestinians in general, but Palestinians of Gaza in particular, and the women and children um, of Gaza um, at this time. I think, you know, the, the um, focusing on the grim consequences of the atrocities that are being committed on Gaza um, and just very, very basic things that are, that the absence of which is really degrading. Um, you know, I mean, basic food necessities, you know, health, needs, uh, reproductive health in particular, um, you know, the hygiene issues that are being faced by, by, by women and, and everybody. Um, I think today covered so much. I mean, we started the morning with why gender matters in foreign policy. Um, we got an overview of uh, historical UN resolutions that were, that was provided by uh, Sheikha uh, Alia Al Thani. Um, we heard success stories. We heard from the former president of Lithuania and from the ambassador from South Africa, the significant role um, of South Africa uh, and South African women at the forefront of the struggle for freedom from apartheid and injustice. Uh, we're very grateful to those women and men. Uh, we're particularly fond 
of South Africa's foreign minister, uh, Grace Pandor, and for her championship um, and for her uh, voice on behalf of Palestinians, not only at the ICJ, but, but more broadly. Um, we salute South Africans uh, for the work that they are doing um, to bring, to try to bring justice to Palestinians. Uh, gender in diplomacy, I think the role of culture, um, uh, the power of women uh, were some of the more important lessons learned in that uh, session. Um, AI in foreign policy and diplomacy, um, the, the perils as well as the promise says that it provides and then finishing with this um, gender in conflict session. Um, it really is remarkable. This day has been remarkable. I want to thank everybody who participated in it, not only by sharing the stage, but by being in the audience, uh, by joining us uh, remotely and the contributions that you have made. Um, and it does take a community to organize a gathering like this. And I remember when uh, our distinguished diplomat in residence, um, Andrula Kaminara, came to see me many months ago with this idea. And uh, it was an idea, it was a conversation, and it has become what it is today. I'm so grateful to you, and I'm so admiring of you and of your energy and of your um, you know, the, the intellectual heft um, and your network uh, that really put this together. Uh, but I know that... Bravo. Uh, you know, we couldn't do this alone. And it weren't, weren't for uh, Christine Shivitz, uh, Karima Daoud, Trudy Hodges, uh, Maha Oredi, um, and, and Jawad, who inspired the design <laughs> for this. Um, conference, uh, none of this would have been possible. Uh, Moza, I want to say you are just a typical Georgetown University in Qatar student. <laughs> uh, in many respects you are, but in many respects you're very special. And uh, thank you for all the great work that you've done for today. Um, every GUPU student is special, and I'm very, very proud of all of you. Um, but very, very importantly, thank you to all of you for participating in this. Now, this is the seventh, and it's the final one for the current academic year. We started in September. Um, we've had since before this one, and now this is the seventh. Um, in the 2024-25 academic year, we will kick off with a major Hewarat conference uh, entitled Palestine in Context. And this will take place on September 21 and 22. So please mark your calendars. And Nada, I hope that you will be able to actually join us in person um, for that. So please mark your calendars accordingly. Um, so we will um, continue to see you. We will continue to engage around these important conversations. Uh, we hope the world will become better. We hope that the world will become better for women and for girls, and we will hope that the world will become better because of women and girls. I want to say I hope that this is the last time that there is a symposium on gender and foreign policy, but I know that's too wishful uh, of a thought, but um, I hope it is one of the last ones that um, is on gender and foreign policy and that we don't have to deal with gender um, separately, that it becomes a non-issue for all the reasons that we've explored today. So once again, thank you to all of you and thank you, Andrew Lapp. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you.